Luke would go one place and Paul would go someplace else. And then Paul or Luke catches us up on that. Uh, so the, the book of Acts then uh, is this gift to us about where things go. And it starts out with the ascension. Um, the ascension of Christ uh, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is this event now which takes place. Um, Christ ascended into heaven 40 days after His uh, resurrection. Now one of the interesting things in the Scripture is you see a number of very interesting ties between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, one of the ways that they date, uh, and if you read through uh, Dr. Steinman's chronology uh, from Abraham to Paul, one of the things that he makes a point of is that Jesus rose on first fruits. And Paul makes a point of this when he, in Colossians where he says, Christ is the first fruits. If you remember, there are two Jewish festivals about this time, actually three. Uh, Passover, which we, uh, we see, and then shortly after Passover is first fruits. It's when the harvest begins. And as the harvest begins, you bring the very first of the fruit to the Lord. Then, 50 days later is Pentecost. And Pentecost is the harvest, of the, the festival of harvest, when the full harvest has been brought in, and you return your tithes to the Lord, your 10% to the Lord. What's interesting about that is, and that those dates, Passover, first and significant about that is, how many are baptized on Pentecost? 3,000. 3,000. Three where does that number show up likewise in the Bible? In Exodus. Exodus. Exactly. In Exodus, the first group that are killed as they're going into the promised land who have denied the Lord, that number is 3,000. Now, I think it's interesting that those two numbers tie together. Those who would not have what the Lord gives, now the Lord gives another opportunity and 3,000 instead of being lost, 3,000 are saved. Bunch of just very interesting things between the New Testament and the Old Testament. But the ascension ultimately is a time chosen by God. And one of the things that I really want to bring out in the ascension is this time frame. Because it's going to make sense when we get to Pentecost how short this time frame is. So what happens? Jesus tells us, His disciples, uh, to make disciples. They are to be His witnesses. Now what's a witness? When he tells what they've seen. Tell them what they've seen. What they've seen and heard. The point of witness is to proclaim the truth about what has been seen. Now in the Old Testament, how did the truth get established? The witnesses of two people. Witnesses of two or three. Okay. The minimum witness setting you had to have was two. Jesus makes use of that in the Gospel of John a couple times when He says the witness of Myself and the Holy Spirit about the Father. So He uses that internal triune uh, point to, to draw the two in. Um, now in the case of the Apostles, there are twelve except what happens? Judas. Yeah, Judas killed himself. Okay? In despair, he uh, takes his own life. Now, we have a very short period where they are called the eleven. Okay? Here in the beginning of the book of Acts. Every other time they're always designated as the twelve. 
And the 12 is a significant number because it ties into the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel. When Levi was not going to get land in the Old Testament, what did they do to make sure there are 12 groups of land? They split Joseph into two tribes, so there would still be 12. Okay? Now, the key is witnessing. And what are they supposed to witness to? One of the things they're supposed to witness to is they saw Jesus alive. They saw Jesus alive after the crucifixion. And so there were a whole bunch of people who had seen Jesus alive. In fact, we're told in the Gospels that He appeared to over a hundred people. In Corinthians, I think Paul mentions even 500 at one time. Right. But we see that specific number, that big number, is their pool to work with. Now, they are to witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What's significant about that order? If you get at home, you go to your neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Jerusalem was right there at home. Okay? People all around them. And the Judea is the bigger area around them. Samaria is what? Country by, country by itself, a country of, what was interesting about the Samaritans? Half Gentiles. Half Jews, half Gentiles. They had some of the truth, but not all of it. So you go to the group that is somewhat similar culturally, but doesn't understand, and then to the ends of the earth you go, completely cross-cultural. In a lot of uh, evangelism things, they'll use this particular text and they'll use it in that way. You go uh, to your neighborhood, to people who are like you in your, your area, to people who you understand, and people that are cross-cultural. Uh, the ends of the earth. Now, the next thing that we find in the book of Acts is this whole issue of the replacement of the apostle. What's fascinating about this to me is they really want the number 12. Now, I had a professor once who said they made a mistake in going after this 12th guy. Because God had somebody picked and his name was Paul. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Because the Bible never says that they made a mistake doing this. It just simply tells us the process they went through. And I think the process is a good one. I think the process helps us understand what these guys were supposed to be doing. Because in a little bit later, in the book of Acts, we're going to get another time when people are set out for a particular role or task. And they are going to be commissioned, set aside, ordained in a sense, to do certain things. Here we have the same situation and there are criteria for the establishment of this uh, continuation. Now they want 12 because 12 is an important number in Israel. And so they go to the scriptures and they say what? May another take his place of leadership. So they recognize that the Scripture is drawing them into, as they read the Old Testament and they look at it, they realize that they're being drawn into seeing this particular need. The disciples replaced Judas, and 
by doing so, one of the interesting things that happens is they help us, give us a little glimpse into the process of qualifications and criteria. The apostle needed to have a couple of different things. He had to be able to see the risen Christ. We know that from the beginning. And what other criteria did they establish? Since the baptism of John. Had to be with them since the baptism of John. What does that mean? Jesus took over. Okay, it is a point in history. Or does it mean that they had to be baptized by John? No, they had to be with, with the disciples from John's baptism on. Why is that an important criteria? Was that the official start of Jesus' ministry? It's the official start of Jesus' ministry, which means they what? They were witnesses. Then. And they got in on the whole body of teaching. Okay, They didn't come in halfway through. They were in the whole body of teaching. From the time He begin teach it, begins teaching His disciples, they were there to hear it all. Now, how many are they left with out of those 100 or 120 or whatever that they start with? Two. Yeah, they, got, they get it down to two. Okay? When they get it down to two, what do they do? Yeah. Well, we don't know what to do here. We'll cast the dice. Okay? Can we do that when we call a pastor? That's up to you guys. <laughs> there were times at the seminary where, uh, where those guys being placed thought that they got their placement simply by the uh, throwing of darts at a map. Uh, that was always the big joke. Uh, if you asked for Texas, you got Canada. If you asked for Canada, you got Texas. Um, I suspect that there were one or two unhappy people and it kind of snowballed. Um, but it seems as if, uh, you know, the New Testament church said, okay, we've done everything we can to distinguish between these two people. And we can't make a decision between these two. So God, you make the decision and they cast the pots. Now, that goes to the apostolic office. It's very interesting, though, that when the disciples begin to die of their own, what does the church not do? Find replacement. Doesn't continue the replacement. Okay? This is also pre what? Pre Pentecost. Mm. So going into Pentecost, they want a full deck. Okay? Now, Jesus ascends on heaven, into heaven, on the 40th day after the resurrection. Pentecost is the 50th day. So this had to take place when? Ten days. Within those 10 days. They didn't waste any time getting that number 12 person. Okay? They went very quickly. Now what's Pentecost all about? As I mentioned before, Pentecost is the first fruits or the uh, birth of the church, Christ is the first fruits, and Pentecost now is the full harvest, the gathering together of that full fruit, and the restoration of what went wrong with God's people in Egypt and in the in the uh, uh, forty years wandering in the wilderness. Okay, what should have happened is. God's people, when Moses came down to the mountain, they should have been there waiting for Moses' return. They should have said, yes, Lord, we'll follow you. When the 12 spies come back, they should have agreed with Joshua and Caleb and said, okay, our God's bigger than any giant there ever is in that promised land, and God told us it's ours, and He keeps His promises, so Moses, let's go. We'll go there straight, we'll go there now, because God is with us. 
That's not what they do. And because of that, there's all kinds of problems. And the first problem they have is the denial of the Lord and 3,000 are, are uh, destroyed. Now God changes that again on Pentecost. What's the other big event in the Old Testament when people uh, took it upon themselves? Babel. Babel, yeah. When the languages are confused. It's the first time after the flood when people do what? Say, we can get along without God. We don't need God. We can build this great big thing. We can get to God by what we do. And we don't really need Him. And God confuses the languages. And the interesting thing at Pentecost is, He takes and He puts the languages back together. In His power, He restores His people. So in Pentecost, we see all of those things being done. Now, yeah. Did he have something referred to the law also? The commandments? Peter's going to do that in a sermon. <coughs> what were you thinking of? I mean, this is what Pentecost means, but didn't Pentecost also mean have a meaning concerning the Ten Commandments of the law? But it was it was mostly a first fruit or a full fruit harvest festival, yeah. Um, now, the Pentecost event itself uh, is significant. We talk a lot about that at various different times, and I'm not going to spend as much time on it because uh, you know we read it every year uh, about the the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Uh, a couple of things to note, though. One is that if you look at the languages, the number of languages that are there, you get to about 15. The other significant thing in there is we heard in our own language and we heard them speaking in our language. And I think from that, Luke is saying that a couple of different things were going on. Peter's preaching was heard by everybody in the language that they best understood. While at the same time the disciples each spoke different languages talking about who Jesus was and what this was all about. So I think at the beginning you have this time where everything is so uh, difficult to make sense of. You have a time when uh, there's this roaring that fills everything and these tongues of fire. Now there's two Old Testament events that I'd like you to at least think about in relationship to that. When Solomon dedicates the temple, how does he know God's going to dwell there? It's filled with a cloud. Yes, the cloud, the fiery pillar, goes into the temple and it fills it so completely that they can't do anything in there. Okay? So they have to wait until the Lord's presence gets out enough that they can go in and begin the dedication. And I think it's significant that the word there in the Old Testament, in the dedication, is the same concept as what is going on here with the sound in Pentecost. That the presence of God fills everything, every nook and cranny. Okay? Now, what was it that symbolized God's presence to the children of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness? Cloud and fire. Okay? So you have two things that are going on in Pentecost show God's presence. You get every disciple getting his own little pillar of fire, and you get the Holy Spirit, like that cloud, filling everything with sound. They can't tell where it comes from, it's just there. I think this is the way that God lets us know today and now that the God who brought His people out of 
Egypt out of slavery, out of bondage, and brought them to the promised land, who nurtured and cared for them, kept his promise in Jesus Christ, and all of his Old Testament promises to bring the Gentiles and all nations in. Remember when, when Dr. Simon went through the book of Isaiah with a number of different things, he was constantly pointing out how Isaiah said, Gentiles are coming in. And Isaiah was clear about it all the way through. Isaiah kept saying, you know, it's not just us. It's not just us, God's chosen people. When God sends Messiah, when Messiah comes, it's going to be for the whole world, for all the nations. And so Pentecost says, it's now. It's here. It's going on right now. Now, the other thing that happens on Pentecost is the baptism of the 3,000. Why did the disciples baptize? It's not something they had done up to this point. Why would they suddenly baptize? That was the command. Yeah. What was the last thing Jesus tells us in Matthew? Yeah. Go make a bunch of disciples. Or make a bunch of disciples, real literally. And the way that you're supposed to do that is to go out. They're not going to come to you. You go to them. And then you baptize them. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And after you've baptized them, what do you do? You teach them. What do you teach them? You teach them everything. And you're not going to do this on your own. I'm with you. And I'll be with you until this time ceases. Okay? until time is no more. Now, how did they get to that point? They got to that point of bapt and, and they baptized because Jesus, ten days before, had said, this is what you do. There wasn't much time lapse between when Christ commands it and when the disciples begin doing it. Now, between that and between Jesus' ascension and, and the, or the speaking in tongues and the baptizing, you get this interesting statement of uh, Peter's sermon. Now, let's take a look at that real quickly. Acts chapter 2, 14 and following. What do you notice about that text? What does Peter do? What's the first thing he does? Here's the Bible. He stood up at the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Okay. Raise his voice. He wants to talk to everybody. But where does he go immediately? Everybody's sober. They're all sober. Nobody right, talks. right. Your first objection that we are drinking? Uh, crazy. I always think that's really funny. Had, has anybody here ever known somebody who being drunk makes them smarter. <laughs> the person thinks they're smarter. <laughs> we had a guy in my first parish that had been trained as an auctioneer, uh, but he was so shy that the only way he'd ever auctioneer anything is if he had about six beers in him. And then he got really loose, and then he would do all kinds of things. Um, didn't make him smarter, it just stopped all of his concerns. Um, but I think it's important uh, that Peter answers that question. Now, the next thing he does is what? He does a lot of quoting from the Old Testament. A lot of quotation from the Scriptures. He says, it's not what you guys think about drinking. Here's what it is. And then he starts in the Old Testament, and he walks down through the Scriptures. 
Why does he do that? Because they're all supposed to know that. They're all going to know it. It's the background. Yeah. They know the Old Testament. What they haven't done is put all of the pieces together yet. Okay? They haven't put all the pieces together yet. All of these Jews are here in Jerusalem for what reason? Passover. <coughs> Passover. Well, they come for Passover, but Pentecost. these guys were here for Pentecost. Which means what? They're faithful Jews. They're keeping the festivals. These aren't just people in Jerusalem who came to see the sights. They came for the festival. And because they came for the festival, we know that these people are people of faith, people of Scripture, people who know their responsibilities and their theology. And so when Peter walks them down through those texts, they're standing there and they're going, yeah, right, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, we understand that. Okay? So immediately at the end, you see what? My goodness, what shall we do? I realize just now how stupid we've been. We killed the Son of God. Messiah came and he died here in Jerusalem and God raised him again, but boy, what do we do now? You know, we're his chosen people and he was going to come to be our Savior and we killed him. What are we going to do next? See, they got it. As soon as the Scripture becomes clear, they understood it. They were able to walk through those scriptural passages and understand what it was that Peter was drawing them to see. First, Joel, the first prophet. Jews for uh, Jesus rally. What's that? First Jews for Jesus rally. First, yeah. <laughs> the first Jews for Jesus rally. That's right. Uh, what's what to me is really fascinating about it is the what the passages then that he uses. He uses the prophets and he uses the Psalms. Okay. Uh, there is a, a Torah in there too, I believe. But he starts with the prophet Joel. And you see a couple of Psalms. And specifically you see what? You see the Psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And what does Peter do? He takes that passage especially and says what? Establish that he's son of David. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you killed both Lord and Christ. What's Christ? The anointed one. The anointed one. What's the Hebrew word? Messiah. Messiah. Okay. This Jesus, this Yeshua, God save us, Je Yeshua, uh, Joshua in our language often. This Yeshua who you put on the cross is the one who God has made Lord. What's significant about that? What's the Lord in the Old Testament? Yahweh. 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 Okay. The one who is the I am the covenant God when you see Yahweh in the Old Testament, you always see those covenant words. Yahweh is what you see with Abraham. I will make you great. Your name uh, will be, you know, you will, you will be the father of many nations. And whoever curses you or blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. 
And he repeats that again in Genesis chapter 15. And he gives him a covenant sign, circumcision, and he says, Abraham, you are going to be. And it's Yahweh who comes to Abraham and Sarah in their old age and says, you're going to have a son. Okay? And there are three visitors, which Luther said often was a way to see the Trinity already. Okay? Now, this Lord and this Messiah is in the person of Jesus Christ. In the person and work of Christ, who you nailed to the cross, this was the one who God sent to keep all of his Old Testament promises. And the result of that is they are what? Cut to the heart. heart. Smacks them right upside the head. The old mule story about the guy who hits the mule with a two by four. God gets their attention in Pentecost and he delivers to them the message. And the message is you killed him. But God raised him. And now we're witnesses to that. We saw him. We saw him go into the grave. We saw him come out of the grave. We walked and talked with him. We are witnesses to the fact that he did rise from the dead. That he did die for the sins of the world. And you know who he was. And they say, what do we do now? Peter says, got a simple solution for you. We're going to do exactly what Jesus told us to do. We're going to baptize you. Baptize you just like Jesus said to do. And we're told 3,000 were baptized that day. Who did the baptizing? All of the apostles. Peter, especially. It's interesting that it never says, because who does the real baptizing? The Holy Spirit. God does it. God does not work in baptism. Always has, always will. From the very beginning, from this point on, God is at work in the waters of holy baptism. We're going to see that all the way through the book of Acts. God is at work in the baptizing and the teaching. He is at work in bringing disciples into His kingdom. And that great gift starts here on Pentecost. But it doesn't end here on Pentecost. What's the next thing we know? And they were gathered together daily and regularly, and they were devoted to the Apostles' Doctrine, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. Now, how many things do you have here? Fellowship, and you got a missionary work. Well, you got teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. That's, you know, all four things. Or there's another way you can read this text, and, and here's where uh, you'll have to bear with me for a little bit of Greek, okay? Uh, in Greek, the Greek word chi is a word that has two functions. One is to set out an explanation of something. And we would translate that as namely. The other function is to link a list or two similar things together. And we would translate that in English as and. Okay? Now, in English, translations most always use the simple and. But you'll notice that there are two ands in this section. If you look at the translation, you'll see we were devoted to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship the breaking of bread, and prayers. Now, were there two things involved 
the apostles' teaching, that is, the koinonia, and the breaking of bread, that is, the liturgy of, and the worship life. Or was there three things? The apostles' teaching, everything the apostles taught, that is, specifically, the koinonia, the fellowship, holding all things, all of our doctrine, all of our teaching in common. The Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread. And the regular gathering for worship. How many vote for the first one? How many vote for the second one? The cool thing about this is you can take it in a number of different ways and each time you do it, each time you take these four things you look at it, it's like looking at a jewel in a slightly different, you know? Have you ever played with like a prism and the rainbow colors come out and you take a couple of those and you kind of, my, my uh, grandparents had this chandelier, uh, crystal chandelier, it wasn't very big. But we would love it when the window, when the sun came in the window a certain way, because it would just splatter color all over the wall. And uh, it was really a neat thing. And as kids, we were really always fascinated by it. There's important truths coming out of each one of those. If we start with the Apostles' Doctrine, they're all baptized, so what's the next thing you do? You teach. You teach everything God's commanded. So they baptized them, and now in the days afterwards, they regularly got together for the teaching. And what did they teach? Well, they taught the koinonia, the stuff that the commonness, the fellowship, the togetherness. They taught about the Lord's Supper, what it meant to be in the body of Christ. And they talk about what it means to be a regularly worshiping community. Now, another interesting way to, to look at those four things is they got together and they learned the Apostles' Doctrine. Namely, that togetherness we have. The togetherness that is not the apostles, it's not anybody private, it is what we hold in common. It is the koinonia, it is the fellowship, it is the togetherness of all that doctrine. And that doctrine is expressed in the way that we gather in the breaking of bread. That is our corporate worship are constantly coming together as God's people gathered around the meal that He has set out for us. Now, the reason I bring that out and, and kind of do a both and on this is these four words are all intricately connected. Okay? We're going to see the breaking of bread as being a word for the Lord's Supper in many different places in the book of Acts. Uh, the breaking of bread is uh, very possibly even the Lord's Supper in Luke on the road to Emmaus. He was the, Jesus was known to the disciples in the breaking of bread. Did the Lord celebrate the Lord's Supper again with those two guys on the road after, after he got into their house? Emmaus. Uh, it's a word that, that Luke uses, uh, and so it could be it could be possible that he already in the, in the gospel uh, intended that breaking of bread to be the Lord uh, word for the Lord's Supper. Uh, but it, clearly here, the breaking of bread is the Lord's Supper, and in, the, in later on in the Book of Acts, it's clear that it's also the Lord's Supper. Um, Koinonia is everything that's held in common. Prayers here is uh, where we get our word liturgy from, actually. It's that common worship time together. 
It was not the individual prayers. It was not private prayer. It was the group. It was the worship. It was the, the uh, coming together as God's people. And then we're told that there's continued growth in the church. That the unity of church and God's continued blessings results in, as Acts puts it, uh, and God added to their number daily those who were being saved. Just a real quick comment and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Was this new growth or transfer growth? It's all transfer growth. It's interesting in church growth principles and when people talk about church growth, they often point to the book of Acts and say, how come the church today can't grow like that? You get 3,000 people on the first service. Uh, you get, you know, 5,000 and, and, you know, it's, it's explosive growth. And the answer really is no, it's not. It's just realizing that what had been taught from little on now focused on the Messiah. So they finally got it. Okay? All they were doing was recognizing that they should have been Missouri Synod all along. <laughs> so they, te they tell the ELCA they're going to the truth. <laughs> Just a little joke there. <laughs> Every little joke. Uh, it's all transfer growth is what we would call it today. It was people who were faithful people of God who understood the Old Testament and just said, oh yeah, we get it now. And so we're going to do what God tells us to do. We're going to be baptized. We're going to learn what Christ was trying to teach us all of those years He was here. And we're going to get together with you guys. We're going to do what the Lord said. We're going to gather. We're going to have His body and blood. And we're going to worship Him as we should. And that all takes place in the synagogue. Okay? Until they, in a number of years, are kicked out. Now, that growth is going to continue. And we'll pick up from there next week. Uh, we're going to go through this first part. Uh, and then we're going to stop and do a little bit with the Reformation. And they'll come back and pick up uh, Paul's missionary journeys. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay. 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 Okay.